Our scripture today continues in the book of Psalms, Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, indeed, it faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it to a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength, and the God of gods will be seen in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God, look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, happy is everyone who trusts in you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we continue our study in the book of songs, our our conversations with God. We've studied different ways the psalmists talk with God. We've seen how close our own conversations are to these, these psalms, these ancient conversations. We talk to God about how we want to live up to God's standards. We talk to God about the good things in our life, and we talk to God about the bad. Just like most of our private conversations, the Psalms are real moments of interacting with God. Today we come to another song of praise. Pastor Bob told us of a a psalm of praise a few weeks ago. You see, there are 150 psalms, and within the 150 psalms, there are a few different genres, and with each different genre, there's a few different styles. Our particular psalm is a psalm of praise. It's a traveling song, a pilgrimage song, talking about the greatness of God. So I want you to imagine what an ordinary day in the life of ancient Israel would be. We're going to start with an olive worker in an olive grove. She's standing in the shade, doing whatever it is that olive workers may do, maybe picking olives, putting them in a basket on their hip, or, or just tending the trees. She's hot, she's tired, maybe trying to distract herself from her task. Much as we do today when we have the radio playing, or we talk with our coworkers, or play solitaire. But this young olive picker isn't distracted by the heat or even the, maybe the pain in her back. She's distracted by the possibility of meeting God in the temple. And so she begins to sing. Much like the song Taylor just played. A song about how God, how awesome it is to worship God. She sings and maybe the others in the grove, they start to sing alongside her. They join together, some harmonize, each imagining a specific time in their lives when they were able to go to Jerusalem and worship in the temple and worship God in God's house. Many of the psalms throughout the book are written with specific instructions. At the beginning of our psalm today, there is a small, short instruction to the song leader, according to the Giddith of the Korahites psalm. Now, we don't really know what the Giddith is or who the Korahites are, but we tend to believe that the, these are instructions on how to sing. I want you to open your hymnal. Everybody get out a hymnal. Open your hymnal to page 62. We sang this song earlier. Now, look at the bottom right-hand corner. And I apologize to all of you who know German. My pronunciation isn't good. Um, There's three words, last uns 
Bear Frauen. And nobody has corrected me, so hopefully it's not bad. And below that, it says 88.44.88 with refrain. How many of you know what these are? Bob, I've taught him twice today. We have a couple of musicians that know what's going on. All right, now I want you to turn to page 931. On 931 is the beginning of the index of tune names and the end of the index of the metrical index. So if you turn the page one more time and you can look at the bottom, you can find in the L's, last uns Erfrauen, and it has three page numbers, 62, 90, and 94. This is the name of the tune that we sang earlier today. And if you notice, this is the name of the tune we sang twice earlier today. Who noticed that the offering was, had the same tune as our first song? There are yeah, well, a few of you noticed. Different words, same tune. There are lots of hymns throughout uh, our hymnal that use the same tune. Now the cool thing is if you go back to the metrical, or to the metrical index, we'll go back to, to 930. If you look at the, the first one at the top of the page, it's 10, 10, point one, or point 11, 11. There are four tunes uh, written down and uh, oh, eight different uh, page numbers. What this is telling you is something really cool about our hymnals is any of those songs can be sung that are, that are listed there can be sung by the other tunes listed. So you could go, you could sing the words to 181 to the tune of 73. And we do this to you sometimes when we don't like a particular uh, tune when we're planning worship, when a song goes a little too high or a little too slow, we'll switch it up on you. And so those of you who follow along in your hymnals every week get a little confused sometimes when the words are different than the tune, and the tune is different. So sometimes we hope that you are just looking at the screens and reading the words and going along with the music that's playing. But this is something that is fun to learn, and I know I'm going to lose a couple of you into your hymnals as you try to find out all of the songs that can fit in each. But these, this is like the instructions of our song to the git, tune of the Gittite. It's a tune that is sung in different psalms. There are three psalms with this instruction in the whole book, Psalm 8, 81, and 84. These three psalms were, were written to be sung to the same tune. Now, the second instruction of the Coralites, we don't really know who the Coralites were, but I assume that that instruction meant their particular way of singing that tune. Just like in different regions of the United States, we change tunes, we change songs just a little bit. You might sing it a little bit faster in one church and then in another, or sing it with a little bit different key. This is what I assume happens with these instructions. Now the hymn itself, it follows a pattern. First, the psalmist sings of the beauty of God's home, of the temple in Jerusalem. Then the psalm shifts to tell the story about the safety of the temple, such a place of safety and sanctuary that, that even sparrows and swallows are safe within. Those who live within God's house be it a sparrow or a human, they, they worship God continuously. They praise God. Then our psalmist shifts to describing the people who worship God. They are happy. The journey to God's house is always on their mind. Now, another thing about the ancient Israelites is they didn't all live in Jerusalem. They weren't able to go to the temple every Sunday or Saturday they weren't able to visit often. So going to the temple, going to Jerusalem was a journey, a pilgrimage that happened if they were lucky once a year, more likely every few years. So going to Jerusalem was an exciting and 
something to look forward to. So when the author talks about the journey, they turn a dry valley into water filled with their faith. They're so excited about getting to Jerusalem that they're kind of ignoring the desert around them. They go from strength to strength. The pilgrims move from one set of uplifting situations to another, from one to another until they get to the temple, until they get to worship God. And the last stanza turns again to God and how wonderful it is to worship God. Worshiping God cannot compare to anything else. It would be better to sit at the doors of the temple, not even being able to go inside, but sitting on the edge and catch, catching just a glimpse. The author is so enamored with worshiping God that anywhere else, anywhere close, becomes so much greater than any material wealth or even comfort. Other translations of this psalm, instead of talking about the tents of wickedness, talk about tents of wealth or tents of comfort. These things that the psalmist is giving up to be with God. Let's go back to our olive picker or sheep herder or what other ancient profession you prefer to think about. Obviously, they're, they're distracted from daily life by the thought of worshiping God and God's temple. Maybe the song was meant to be sung as they traveled toward Jerusalem, to the temple. A group song that everyone would get excited to sing. They'd get excited for, to keep their spirits up when the traveling got hard or something went wrong. How many of you ever uh, chaperoned a bus of children? <laughs> I see some sad faces. <laughs> it's exhausting. Children go a little bit crazy, when, especially when they're all together on a bus. Sometimes, at least when I was a kid, our chaperones would start singing. We'd sing camp songs. We always had to take a bus all the way out to Storm Mountain to get to church camp. And the chaperones on there would sing camp songs to get us excited and to get us to calm down a little bit and stop throwing things at each other. Now, this is something we do with kids Today, when we have air-conditioned buses and we, we move them quickly from place to place, can you imagine a caravan full of kids through the desert? You'd need these songs to get them excited, to get yourselves excited about walking farther and farther and farther to get to Jerusalem, the days that it took, the weeks that it would take to get to the temple. Now think about your own lives. Are there times when worshiping God distracts you from your other duties? Have you ever been so excited to go to church that you hum a tune or you sing a little song? I get to go to worship, I get to go to worship. No, okay. Don't sing my song. Worshiping God in the temple was so important to the psalmist that he would give up a thousand days of prosperity just to go that one time. Maybe his choice to make the journey toward Jerusalem lost him an important business deal. How often do our excuses go to God rather anywhere else in life? I'm sorry, God, I can't make it to worship today. We've got this activity going on, and they're not very accepting of excuses, and I know you'll forgive me. Oops. I forgot to go to worship this week. I just got a little too busy. I just need to sleep a little bit more. I'll come next week. Our lives, it turns out, distract us from God. We lose ourselves in our, our jobs, our activities, our friends, and our events. We forget that God desires our attention. God wants our love. We know that God loves us. In the church, we talk a lot about how the story of Christ, how God came into the world to show us his love. We talk about how, how Christ died for our sins to show us his love. But we don't talk as much about how God wants our love. The Old Testament, especially the Psalms, talk a lot about God wanting us to worship 
God wanting us to want to praise. God wants us to sing about how great worship is and to mean it. How many times do we stand and sing in worship and just kind of say the words as they go along? We're not even sing because we don't know the song and don't want to try. Worship when we mean it, when we truly think about what we're singing, about what we're saying, means so much more. So imagine with me how the church, what the church would look like if we acted like the psalmist, if we were distracted by God. What would the church look like if God were our excuse to the world, not to whom we excuse ourselves? What would the church look like if we were really excited to go to church and worship God, like really antsy, getting there 20 minutes early just so you can get a seat, can't sit still, bubbly, in kind of excitement? Ooh, that's the church I go to. I can see it. That's the one. I get to spend with God. I get to spend time with God. Woohoo! It doesn't matter whether there's a new song or a new instrument. I get to worship God today. What would the church look like if worshiping God were more important than business deals or, or, or fancy homes? What if God were actually the most important part of our lives? This is the beauty of the psalm. It is pure, unadulterated joy at the love of God. How exciting worship can be, how beautiful God is. So let's get distracted. Worship God in the unexpected moments of your life when you're supposed to be paying attention to something else. Get distracted by the Spirit of God saying, come to me, follow me. The disciples did it. They followed the man they had just met because they were distracted by God saying, follow this man, follow me. And look how they changed the world. Look how amazing it changed when the disciples were distracted by God. Think of the things we can do when we are as well. Let's pray. Heavenly God, distract us from our own importance. Help us to see that one day with you is truly better than a thousand in any fancy home. You are our God and our place is with you each and every day. Distract us with your love, distract us with your worship. In Christ's holy and wonderful name we pray. Amen.